Welcome back again to Solving Basketball. I am Jordan Sperber, and today's guest is Adrian Atkinson, who is the founder of The Secondary Break, which is a UNC basketball website, and he also has a great Twitter account that is UNC-related that features both X's and O's and data, and particularly the intersection of the two, which is kind of what this this uh, podcast is about. So thank you so much for coming on, Adrian. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jordan. So the first question of the podcast, I'm not sure if you have if you have listened at all, but the first question to each guest is, if we walked into a gym right now and I went under the hoop and you went to the foul line and shot 100 free throws in a row, I rebounded for you, how many would you make out of 100? <laughs> I was actually, I was doing my homework this morning and catching up on some old podcasts. So I was a little bit ready for this, but uh, yeah, funny story. I actually, a couple weeks ago, I accidentally locked myself out of the house. Uh, I just forgot my keys, but luckily I had my basketball, you know, I was in the garage, so I was able to go outside with my basketball and I had about, you know, two or three hours to kill until my wife get home from work and unlocked the door for me. So I actually shot not a hundred, but I shot a set of 25, you know, from the line rebounding myself and I made 22 out of 25. And, but I think, I don't think I'd extrapolate that to 88. I think something in the 78, 79 range would probably be pretty accurate. The, the stroke is still pretty feathery, though. I'm, I'm pretty confident from the line. What is basketball? What is, what is, what is, what is, is this basketball? Is that basketball? What is, what is basketball? <laughs> gotcha so okay there are a couple of things to unpack there first of all you know good good free throw shooter uh but also you know you're talking about extrapolation like like a true data scientist uh which which i know you are so first of all what what's your basketball background um to to have the the free throw shooting stroke well i played i played in high school you know i'm from western pennsylvania so I, as a high school point guard you know nothing great just a pretty steady point guard, nothing flashy. Uh, and that was about the extent of, you know, I never playing college, went to university of Richmond when, uh, when John Beeline was there actually. And actually junior year, they're having walk out, walk on tryout. And I did try out for that, made one cut, but you know, nowhere close to making the actual roster. And it was a uh, Jeff Neubauer, I think that was running the tryouts. Who's I think at Fordham now, he was at Eastern Kentucky for a while, but yeah, that, so, I mean, I played a lot of intramurals, played through grad school, you know, still play pickup now. Uh, we have a pretty good work uh, group that plays once a week. So, uh, yeah, so pretty much a three-point shooter now, just relying on that, that three-point touch. But, yeah, I love to play. Gotcha. And then from a data science and analytics perspective, were you interested in it because of basketball? Like, you know, that that's kind of how I got interested in, in statistics, basketball and baseball, I guess, or... Or did did the combining the two come later? Uh, no, I was always like you're saying. It was baseball, really, for me when I was you know nine or ten years old. I got the '87 Bill James Abstract, you know, the one with the the yellow cover, <laughs> and that was kind of my my gateway drug, I guess, into sports analytics. And it was really more about baseball for me growing up, and then basketball a little bit later. Obviously, you know, Dean Oliver's basketball on paper, and you know all the all the stuff there, I started thinking more about the basketball analytics side of it. The number one reason that I'm having you on is uh, I really based off of this podcast, I've had several coaches ask me about offensive charting. And it's something that I've been doing a little bit recently, not for every Virginia game, but um, for some of the Virginia games. And then talked about it on the podcast a little bit. And you do it for, I believe, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, every uh, UNC game. I I have the the data pulled up from what you tweeted in the Duke game that that I want to talk about a little bit. But what is well? How long have you been? How long have you been charting UNC? Um, like from an X's and O's and data perspective. Well, I've been charting games since uh, I guess the '04 season. Although I've taken a couple seasons off. I didn't do the '05 championship year. I didn't do a few from you know 2014 through 2016 because of just, you know, work commitments and, you know, how, whatever was going on in my life at that point. But, yeah, 
I've more or less charted consistently since uh, the whole the whole time. I've been back at UNC, but I've only added the X and O stuff or like the uh, the play calling things or you know efficiency by play type mm-hmm. this season and a little bit last year. I always broke it down into primary, secondary, and then kind of half court offense. But I didn't break secondary down into all the different actions as much as I've been doing this year. But yeah, it started out, I was just doing more lineup data, you know, plus minus stuff and how different lineup combinations did. And then kind of every season, I would add a little bit more and a little bit more. In 2006, I added the defensive charting, and I've been doing that ever since. But every, every, every season, I usually add a new wrinkle or two or just something I'm interested in or something that I, you know, read an article about or, you know, seems relevant. So how much is this, like you mentioned the lineup stuff, which could be done with, with play by play data and essentially, you know, computer programming versus what you're doing now, breaking down specific secondary break actions. How much of it is computer programming versus, manually watching the game uh it's a pretty good mix i guess i'm trying to move in the direction of things that you need to actually you know there, there are more and more sites and resources out there you know the soup map and all these different things that can you know the stuff that ken palm's doing and, and you know bark they're doing all the play-by-play parts and stuff and you know that data is out there it's obviously better than i only do it for carolina so you don't know, you lose the national context so i'm trying to focus more on the things that you truly need, you know, to be in front of the TV or, you know, to actually watch the game. So, you know, things like how contested is the shot, you know, what, you know, shot selection type issues. The defensive charting is still a thing that you can't really get out through a box score. I mean, Synergy has a little bit of it, but like, I don't think they do a great job with, or, you know, I've seen some, some disagreements with my data and, you know, what, what synergy does. So. I guess more specifically on the defensive charting, I actually haven't seen it. Um, so I'm, I'm curious on a given possession, what are you, what are you charting for UNC's defense? Well, it's actually, it's basically, I mean, I've been doing it for a long time now. And it's basically the uh, Dean Oliver's kind of the uh, template he laid out in basketball on paper. Yep. Where it's more of a, well, this is an interesting question. I know the, uh, the Carolina staff, does defensive charting and grading, obviously. And there's just more of a process-based thing, which I'm, I'm sure is the same way for you when you're in New Mexico State or on, you know, on different staff. Mm-hmm. You're not looking at, did they score a basket? You know, did this guy give up a basket? But did he, you know, do his fundamentals properly? You know, did he, did he stop the ball from going middle or, you know, have a textbook wall in the paint or whatever? But mine is more about results, although I track some of the, you know, some of the fundamental things also. But, you know, if, if Garrison Brooks plays perfect positional post-defense, but, a you know, a seven-footer still shoots a jump hook over and scores, you know, I'll credit that hoop to Brooks, even though the staff would probably give him a good play on that because his fundamentals are perfect. He's just physically overmatched. But like, you know, Kenny Williams, a guy like Malik Monk or Tyus Battle, or, you know, some of these bigger, more athletic wings will sometimes pull up over him and hit a jumper. But his actual, you know, his positional defense is, is as they teach it. So, but really, what I'm doing is more of a results based thing. It's outcome based. But I do deflections and you know, missed box outs. So some things like that, and then some some things where it's more did the shot go in or the shot not go in. We actually at, at New Mexico State last year did some stuff that's very similar um, in terms of every single point that we gave up had to be attributed to both a player and you could split it. So, so if, if it was yep. a two point basket, it could be one and one. Yeah. Most ball screens end up being split for me. Yep. Ball screens, uh, even, even on a drive, potentially just a regular drive. If, yeah. Yeah. Late help rotation. Right. Right. Exactly. The help defender really sometimes on ball screens, there could be, you, you, I usually we would just keep it to where two guys are involved in, in the points, but really on a ball screen, it could be three guys involved depending on what your coverage is. Yeah, your tagger. Yep, exactly, exactly. I called it defensive accounting in the sense that yeah, every single point had to be given to both a player and and an action as well. So ball screens, help, yep. that, that kind of thing. The the process is important, um, but. To an extent, you know, you can have a really, really good positional defender, but if he's just limited athletically, you know, he shouldn't necessarily be 
playing more minutes if, if that's what you're trying to figure out. It's it's a it's a fine line, I guess. And then the other thing that I used to tell our coaching staff, and, and I'm curious if you have a way you have more experience in the defensive charting if you've been doing this for for that long than than myself is I would say, well, you know. He it was good defense. They just made the shot, but over the course of the season, it's it's going to work itself out a little bit. So, have you seen that in terms of almost like the predictiveness of this charting? Do you think that like how long does it take? I guess to to start to have interesting data. Uh, I mean, it does tend to even out over the course of the year. You know, if a guy gets a couple, if you know, if he has a couple of contested baskets made on him, you know, those things will even out over the course of the year. Uh, three point. Defense sometimes never. I mean, the the college season won't be long enough to get a big enough sample. Mm-hmm. So a guy might like this year. I think Seventh Woods, like opponents are shooting like thirteen percent on him on three pointers, and some of that's been. I mean, he is good out there and he he closes out well, but he's been very lucky also, and maybe that that will probably regress a little bit to you know twenty twenty five percent by the end of the year, but it still won't be indicative of. You know, he won't be that good of a three-point defender. So that's, you know, especially for three-pointers. I think two-pointers, and obviously, like, if, if guys who are foul-prone, those things will regress and normalize a lot quicker. But the three-point part is noisy. I mean, I don't think the college season's long enough to eliminate all that noise. Offensively, a really interesting thing about North Carolina is that they have been the same for for so many years in terms of the I mean the secondary break is is what you ha- um, have called your your website and and they have been doing that for years and years. Uh, you said that just recently you've got more into the the breakdown of the secondary break itself. How many different options are you charting from the secondary break? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've got 11 in here, I think, but I know, I'm, I know there are like 15 or 20 or, I mean, you hear different numbers. Like, I know this is not like an exhaustive list. So I'm probably combining, like, I know, you know, I've, I've talked to some people within the program and some managers and, you know, I've, I know some of the play calls and some, I just use like, you know, common basketball vernacular. Mm-hmm. So this is all the, all the ones you see again and again and again are accounted for here, but there are probably some that I'm maybe I'm smushing two into the same group or something like that. But yeah, there are 11 right now in my, in my secondary uh, section. Just out of curiosity, you know, when, when I think I, you know, I, I think one of my years in high school, we ran the, the secondary break. And the, the thing I think of first is just, reverse the ball and then that back screen lob back screen cross screen yeah 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 into the cross screen right right yeah that's secondary that's that's their regular you know that's what they call secondary regular and that's their their baseline right there that's like the main secondary action so so how many uh, i don't know if you have this how readily you have this data available but how many times have they gotten that lob this year either approximately or or if you have the numbers they've run they've got like regular secondary regular has ended 179 possessions this year, so about eight a game, I guess, or so seven or eight a game. Uh, but it, that's obviously that includes all regular actions. You know, it can be the high low pass. You know, the post to post high low. It can be the cross screen. Uh, the the lob they've gotten maybe three or four times all year, and part of that is because they don't have. Like when they had Isaiah Hicks and Bryce Johnson and more athletic, you know, fours and fives, they could throw that pass and, you know, finish above the rim. But now they have Luke May. Uh, they have, you know, Cam Johnson playing a lot of small ball four. Uh, Brooks is an okay finisher, but he's not a Bryce Johnson kind of athlete. So they're not really – they're not getting many lobs this year. But, I mean, they, in, in, in the ACC especially, that stuff is so well scouted. Like St. Carolina's been running it for forever. Right. And that's like the number one, you know, that taking away that lob is kind of the first thing you want to account for, you know, no easy layups, no easy dunks. So teams felt pretty well on that. So it's usually later in that secondary action that they'll get something out of it. Either when that, you know, after the back screener pops to the, to the top of the key, they've got some Cam Johnson threes that way, or on that cross screen, you know, they got a couple against Duke just on simple cross screen actions. No doubt. And that's, that's the part you said where ACC teams are, have it so well scouted. And, and I would imagine that 
probably non-conference teams do too. They they just might not have the personnel to to stop it necessarily, but it's a fine line. So we would do some charting of our opponents. And for instance, we played Illinois last season and they're like North Carolina in the sense that they run the same stuff a lot. So it's really conducive uh-huh. to charting. And they start out their offense. It's it's not the secondary break it, by any means, but there is there's two cuts. There's the first cutter and the second cutter in their offense. And so I chart. I went back. We we played them in non conference, and they probably played six or seven games at that point that were against good competition. So I, I charted all of those games, and they basically had barely gotten any points off of the first and the second cutters. But the thing is. It's you can look at it one of two ways. Well, they don't get they don't score off of it. We don't have to worry about it. Or everyone that they have played against have has gone through a lot of scouting to make sure that they don't score off of yeah. it and, and we still have to pay attention to it. Bringing this back to UNC now, I guess if you were preparing to play against UNC, let's say let's say you you were coaching Duke, uh like how much practice time are you giving to to taking away that lob or, or or is there anything in the secondary break that you think that you should focus on? I mean, I think I probably would focus on taking away all the, all the secondary regular actions, you know, the lob first and foremost, and that, that cross screen and making sure there's no open three pointers, you know, after the back screen. And that's the one they run most frequently. If it's there, they're going to take it every single time, right? So if you're unprepared for it, they're just going to kill you with it. I mean, just rim runs, but that high, low seal, I mean, they'll beat you with these very simple actions if you're not ready for them. So I would say, I mean, all the other kind of more complex or, you know, like the secondary, secondary actions are all predicated on secondary regular. So I would focus on taking regular away first and then, you know, maybe work on a couple of the of the other actions that they run a lot. I think first and foremost, you take away regular just because if you don't fail, They'll just they'll run it until you stop it. So let's say you do take it away. This is a, a question I get about charting a lot. I guess it's, well, you you mentioned Dean Oliver, and and I think this is where I got the concept from the difference between a play and a possession, which is in basketball uh-huh. on paper. So if in your charting system, I'm looking at I'm looking at the Duke numbers. So in their primary break against Duke, UNC was one point four four points per I'm thinking that's play I'll I'll let you I'll let you speak on that and then in the secondary break it was 0.92 and then in half court freelance Uh 0.82 so let's say they run the the back screen cross screen action it's defended well and then they go into what you call half court freelance their motion offense yeah how do you chart that from a secondary break perspective uh it's just not it like it didn't happen I mean I'll I'll Right, you know, I'll record the uh, the set, the secondary set that they ran, but in terms of like it won't be there in that denominator at all. You know, it will just be like it never happened. It will only be what ends, you know, what action ends the possession. So if it's like a baseline out of bounds, you know, it's just whatever whatever the terminal action is. You know what it so. Right. So with a secondary break, or even with their their sets, their half court sets that can flow into the motion yeah. freelance that's yeah what i would do was i would have a possessions column which would mean any time that uh we took a shot or turned the ball over or got to the free throw line out of one of those things and then also a plays column as well and the the distinction there is like you said the denominator yeah it's you have to compare apples to apples a little bit and and sometimes teams are only running half court sets to get the perfect shot. They're not, I mean, realistically, they're not going to take a contested shot. So it's, it's hard to evaluate it up to the, the half court freelance stuff where that's going to be late shot clock. They're going to have to take something, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's probably, I think I will add that next year, the, the play versus possession distinction. I mean, even knowing how many times, they get a shot or, you know, just kind of that per- mm. the possession to play kind of percentage is valuable information. You know, if you run secondary regular 50 times, 
a game, which they don't, but if you run it 20 times, you only get five or six. And, you know, it, times where it's ending the possession, then that's kind of interesting to know. Or, like, how do, how do those possessions flow after a play that doesn't that's not a possession? You know, are those efficient half-court possessions or, you know, has wasting that 10 or 12 seconds on the shot clock had some kind of, you know, adverse effect? That'd be – I'm not sure that's, that's good to know, though. I think that's a key distinction. So I think I will add that, you know, going forward. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I saw you tweeting about the half court box sets. I think it might have been yesterday. How many different sets? So this is another question I get more from from uh, just college basketball fans: is how many sets do does does a team have? So since if you've been charting this stuff, UNC is really, you know, they they as your numbers show. Um, I think I saw you say that 48% of their their possessions this season have been either primary or secondary breaks, so half of their possessions in the break. And yep. I'm sure a pretty good chunk of them are are half-court freelance too, uh, the, the motion yeah. stuff. So that doesn't leave a ton of the percentage for, for sets. Yeah, 6.5% 6, 6. to be precise. For sets? Yeah, under under 7%, so 4 or 5 a game maybe. Are they all out of the box set? Uh, or, or do they have some other stuff too? They have a few other ones. They run. They've been running more of their open freelance this year, which has a couple. Lot, some of it's just freelance, and some is actual sets. You know, they'll have a little UCLA cut, and then it, it's almost like horns action. They'll have their bigs on each elbow, and they'll run a little two-man game either on the strong side elbow with you know a little pick and roll or dribble handoff, or they'll you know it's like that two-man front that Beeline uses. They'll get it over that weak side elbow and run dribble handoff over there so that's a pretty common one they run they've been doing a little flare screen for may this year or for cam at the, at the four where it's just a ucla cut for the wing and then a little flare that's kind of a quick hitter they've used but i'd say most of it is out of the box you know most anytime they're on a set or like you know 90 percent of their sets are out of the box formation and they've got lots of different options there and counters right and it, it makes it difficult to scout if they all start in the same formation because you don't know exactly what's going to happen right. next so at, at new mexico state uh coach jans all of his sets start in in like a diamond almost and uh-huh. and it's it's really hard to scout it's it, you really do he, he i think he probably has more than than uh, north carolina does but Sometimes when it, it would get a little bit tricky to figure out the best way to run the action or get the player involved that, that you needed just because um, he wanted to start in that exact uh, formation. So it's a little bit of a give and a take where, where you're making it really hard to scout, but potentially you have to get a little creative within your sets. Again, I, a, lot of, a lot of coaches, for the coaches that I've worked for, uh, like the big prerequisite for sort of having opinion on the team was... Or, or giving suggestions was like, yeah, I'm open to it for sure, but you have to watch the film. And I think that's what charting uh-huh. does. I feel comfortable getting your North Carolina opinions because I know that you've watched all the films. So what do you think, I guess, holistically about the offense in terms of if there was anything to improve upon within the different portions of their offense, how much they run it, what they run? Um, is, is there any constructive criticism you'd have from the from the charting uh, this year or in general? Just you know, from a from a system either. perspective. Yeah, either. Yeah, I mean, this year obviously they're not. They don't really have that. They don't have that Tyler Hansbro or Sean May or you know the Bryce Johnson kind of back to the basket guy. Even a Kennedy Meeks, like somebody you can throw the ball to, is in secondary or you know a rim runner who's going to get you the you know Tyler Zeller type who's going to get you those easy baskets. You know, back to the basket. So, but I mean, the, the system is flexible. Not they're not throwing nearly as many post entries as they have in past years. You know, they're playing more four out stuff, or like you know, using secondary options that aren't focusing on the two big, you know, the double post cross screens and you know the the two big action. Although I mean, the high low stuff is kind of part of what they always do. So I mean, I think the, the system is flexible in terms of you know if your personnel is more perimeter oriented it can account for that. Uh, but really, I mean, the way they, I mean, I think Roy would want to score obviously in primary break anytime he can, obviously, I mean, they're, you can push the ball and, you know, make, you know, have your layup block a hundred times in a row. And, you know, that's no good. You don't want to push the ball against like a set defense, but I mean, 
scoring early makes a lot of sense, right? Against an unset defense, easier for offensive boards. So, I mean, philosophically, I like the way that they they push push in primary anytime you can, look for a quick hitter in secondary, and then that naturally flows into your into your freelance motion. Uh, I guess there are sometimes, I guess early in the season, he kind of lets the team learn. Or like, you know, with young teams especially, you have to learn like all those freelance reads, even secondary break. It's, you know, the, the point guard and the, the trailing big have a lot of reads they have to make. And so there are times when calling more set plays could make uh, the – the efficiency, you know, the offense will be more efficient for that particular game, but from like a season long or like a program perspective, I think you want your guys to kind of learn, or, you know, make some mistakes that, or like have those kind of teachable moments on film. So, I mean, there probably are times where he'd call more set plays. If you're looking like in the national championship game or like in a tournament game, you'll see more sets, more after timeout stuff, you know, more of like a secondary slip for an easy dunk call it like an advantageous time. So, I mean, season long, I think, I mean, I really like how they run the program. And I think that's why Carolina tends to get better and better. You know, they're always peaking or usually peaking in February and March because they kind of learn, you know, Roy's not micromanaging, you know, he's not calling those timeouts and, or like calling all those set plays. The guys are learning the system, learning on film. One specific thing that has been talked about with the system and, and Carolina this year is Nasir Little. He... Probably his his most natural position in college basketball would be the four. Obviously, there's a pretty big difference in the in the Carolina system between a three and a four. Uh, you know, the four and the five tend to be interchangeable. One's going to rim run, one's going to yep. trail. The two and the three tend to be inter- interchangeable. They're both going to run their wing. Has there been anything different X's and O's wise to better incorporate Little's game this season, or has it just been developing him into that system? A little bit of running sets for him. I mean, mostly just trying to incorporate it and, like, have him learn. Like, he was playing for a while there, trying him at the four with Cam at the three, you know, when they went small. Mm -hmm. But lately, it's been Cam at the four because he's been, you know, kind of better positioned to take advantage of those those mismatches, which are often on the perimeter against, like, a guy, you know, a if you have a big on you who's not used to coming off a pin down or whatever, or just defending in space, you know, nah, uh, Little's not ready to hit those shots yet. Uh, yeah, that's one thing. I guess they have, they put a few, uh, a few small wrinkles in. Like they've been running a side elevator, like their elevator door screen, and they've been using Little on the weak side and running a backdoor lob for him, which has gotten, a, you know, a couple dunks, which is a nice little wrinkle. And a couple, they've, inverted him in the box a couple times to get him post-ups as a wing, which is something they used to do for McCants and for Harrison Barnes. You know, just that slice cut they have, you know, that, that shuffle cut, that classic Carolina shuffle cut. Mm-hmm. They'll have a little run that and get him against a smaller wing down there and, you know, let him go to work in the post. But that's, I mean, a lot of people have been saying, you know, we should do that more. Or, you know, he's got this tiny guy in him. It's a mismatch. Let's just throw it in the post the little, you know, 20 times in a row. But that's not really how. That's not how the Carolina system works, really. You know, they don't exploit mismatches. So that's another thing. To go back to your last question, one thing they might do better or they could do better is exploit mismatches and have, like, opponent-specific game plans. And they do more of that, you know, in the postseason and against Duke and, you know, late in the conference season. But for a, you know, for a random December game, they're not going to do that. And, you know, it might hurt the efficiency a little bit, but I think it's better for the long-term health of the offense yeah that makes sense and and there, there's a trade-off there always too uh with with attacking mismatches it you know theoretically it should be i guess positive expected value for your efficiency but if you if your offense gets bogged down and and you almost have tunnel vision in the mismatches it, it can be tough to to increase your efficiency with little i think the the interesting backing up from just north carolina and more generally the the idea of positionless basketball is is pretty cliche and and a lot of people throw out the term but to me it's i guess specifically on offense if it matters who the 1 who the 2 who the 3 who the 4 and who the 5 are in your offense and there aren't that many teams that are actually positionless even though we talk about how it's going that way because at the very least mm-hmm. the 5 man is 
even if you're not posting the five man up necessarily anymore, he's he's the ball screener. So I don't, you know, positionless basketball isn't necessarily even a good or a bad thing one way or the other. But that would be that would be what I would say about the Carolina system is that it's definitely not positionless. You know, the freelance is is where it can start to get more positionless. But the right. sec- secondary break is and, and the sets are are, are rigid, um, and that's not that's not they necessarily are. a bad thing. But I think it's it's been where trying to figure out how to incorporate little uh, who doesn't have maybe the the a true true position that's that's where the challenge has been yeah i agree and that harrison barnes had some of the same problems and that mm-hmm. was in, that was with hansen and zeller mm-hmm. so that was a two post team where the spacing like the spacing on this team is actually a lot better than in 2012 or 2011 when harrison barnes was here but i mean that's the type of like archetype you know that that kind of iso wing or like somebody who's looking to do stuff off the dribble you know that's really not what freelance is about at all you know like Duke's offense really catered to that this year. And obviously there are a lot of just, you know, spread pick and roll offenses that cater to that. But freelance really, it's not about, it's about moving the ball and, and then cutting, right? Screen away, just simple move the ball and cut concepts. And Little is used to having the ball in his hands. He's looking to back you up and ISO you and, you know, make a move. And Barnes was the same way. I mean, Barnes was a little more skilled at it. But that type of wing, sometimes it's a hard time in Carolina's offense. And like you're saying, it's a little bit rigid. The spacing is not always great when you have that, when you have two true bigs. So yeah, I think little is not a great fit for what they're trying to do offensively. And then that's where the, uh, the context and trying to figure out NBA draft prospects, that's, you know, it's not necessarily something that I focus a ton of my work on, but, but for, for the draft people that that's where it becomes hard. It's, it's hard to project, uh, it's hard to watch North Carolina's system and Nazir Little in that system uh, and figure out what it's going to look like when he's not playing in anything close to that system at, at the NBA level. You know, it's 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 a challenge to to figure that out. Yeah, definitely. Last UNC specific question. You know, you you're the guy when it comes to um, this the X's and O's and the data for for UNC basketball, and I, I like to ask this question to to guess of specific fan bases, what is the appetite of the fan base for this advanced content that you do? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, I like to think Carolina's got a pretty, you know, basketball savvy fan base, you know, back in the Dean Smith days, he was one of like the, the early pioneers in points per possession, you know, mm-hmm. Frank McGuire and Dean Smith kind of brought that concept into the mainstream. They defined the possession a little differently than it's, than it is now, but, uh, and I mean, coach Smith was a math major, you know, he, he used to chart all kinds of stuff in practice and had kind of that analytical philosophy within the program. And I don't, I don't think, uh, Roy is not quite as into that. I don't think, but as a fan base and, you know, the whole Carolina way thing, you know, I, I think the fans appreciate good basketball and the analytical side of it. So I think there's a pretty good appetite for it, but I mean, it's like anything else. There's, there's some fans who, who are just, they, they just like to watch the game for their heart, you know, and, or like make their, have their hot takes and make snap judgments and have like these conventional wisdoms and you can throw, you know, a hundred relevant statistics at them and it's not going to change their mind about, you know, some preconceived notion they have that, you know, they're just going to cling to. But I mean, I think, I think Carolina's fan base is, is great about it. You know, some people really love it and are really, they, you know, they, they study it on their own. And some folks don't know much about it, but they're very open to learning. And if you provide, like, some of these intro or, like, some of these, you know, uh, basic concepts, they'll, they'll gravitate to it and they'll, they'll ask smart questions and they'll, they'll want to know more. So, yeah, I think it's pretty good in general. Mm-hmm. And yeah, anecdotally, I can say that uh, that I have some of my stuff has been pretty well received by the by the fan base. So yeah, that's it incentivizes me anyways to to keep doing UNC stuff. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, lastly, here to to shift gears, uh, you were the director of data engineering at Automated Insights, and this actually goes back to the very first episode of Solving Basketball with with I, I was talking to Ken Pomeroy about scouting and one of the ways the conversation went was that 
some of the very basic scouting stuff that a coach does, whether it's, uh, I mean, a lot of coaches are go on Kempom and, and look at the four factors and uh, different things. In that podcast, I made the distinction between scouting and game planning. So then game planning is like trying to figure out what decisions we're going to make based off of all that information. But just the scouting itself, I talked about how I thought that some of that could be just automated into a scouting report. Coaches and staffs are spending a lot of time writing that stuff up. Um, and and Automated Insights, the company that, that you worked for, does that same thing but for but for the ap uh media for post game or pre-game reports and we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording uh, but what do you think about automated scouting reports oh uh, yeah like i was telling you uh before my very first we had our very first company hackathon at ai i think back in 2012 or 2013 and my idea the thing i worked on was i called it stat scout we were still stat sheet or just transition from stats from stat sheet. And uh, yeah, that, the concept is just like you're describing, right? It's just automating this basic scouting report data. So you get it before every game and it'll just be simple things like, you know, player X is taking 85% of his shots from behind the arc. So, you know, make sure you run them off the line or just basic four factors things about, or, you know, which guys are, great in the offensive class, you know, just like you're saying, the kind of things, kind of that base layer you need in, before you can do your scouting report or your game planning. So, yeah, I think it's actually, I mean, I think AI would do a really good job of it. I don't know if there's the appetite for it because most of AI's projects are things that you can scale to like millions of people, you know, mm-hmm. like the Yahoo fancy football things or, you know, things like even like division two, II, division three, uh, uh, previews and recaps, whereas this might have a very, it might be like just a small segment of, of coaches. But it, I mean, within like a department, it'd be a great thing to automate for like, a, you know, the video guy or an analytics guy within a program, in, like it's an off season project. I think it would save you a lot of time and be like a very helpful tool that you just get, you know, print out before every game and use it as like a, a jumping off point. Yeah, so the the one specific thing you mentioned, which was almost exactly what I was thinking about, is uh, the percentage of shots that are from threes. So in yep. in the college basketball world, especially around this time in March, when you're playing teams on really short prep time, everyone's sharing scouting reports with, with one another on, on different opponents. And so you get to see a lot of teams' different scouting reports. And that's that's a very common one is, you know, 73% of the shots are from three. Right. I, um, I'm just trying to maybe explain this a little bit for, for the coaches listening. Uh, anything that you are consistently doing on, a, on an opponent for every single scout, that is what would be room for automation. So so that's an example, and, and it could where where AI or or people with those types of skills uh, can go further is that it's not it doesn't just tell you 72% but it says it would be a report that then writes out in basketball language okay you know short closeout on this player because yep. of that data uh, am i getting that right oh yeah or even like at the team level you know if they're having like a small percentage of their field goals assisted you know, they're probably more of a an ISO team, like more of a one-on-one team. Or, I mean, just, you know, basic four factors are like you know, the things Ken Palm has. Like you're saying, you can write basketball language around each of those four factors or like combinations of those factors. And obviously you can do it for every single player or like the top five or top seven or whatever. But, I mean, yeah, almost everything has some kind of pretty actionable insight that you can draw and put it into basketball terms. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it makes a lot of sense. You mentioned stat sheet, which was a part of AI, if, if I'm correct. And I'm sure the stat geeks listening to, to this episode remember stat sheet. There were a lot of unique things on there. I, one thing that I remember was referee uh, officiating information. Yep. How involved were you in stat sheet? And, and I guess what happened? Uh, stat sheet was our, our founder, our CEO, Robbie Allen who's a huge Carolina fan too. He kind of worked on stat sheet as a side, he was at Cisco as an engineer 
and Seth, he was kind of his side project for, you know, four or five years. And finally, he had it far enough along that he said, you know, I'm going to, this is what I love. I love college basketball. I love, you know, staff. I'm going to turn this into a company. So originally it was just, it was kind of like Ken Palm, right? It was just, uh, it was advertising dollars, it, you know, just website traffic. It was kind of the month. That's how we we're monetizing it. And that's before I came around right after we got our series A round, you know, after we got funded and we had pivoted from doing just the stats to actually writing automated previews and recaps as a way to just get more articles, more eyeballs. It was still, it was still all about getting eyeballs and advertising dollars. But yeah, that's kind of how it pivoted from stat sheets to automated insights. And then we got the Yahoo fantasy football deal and that kind of blew up. That was like our big thing. And then these big companies were giving it. I mean, that's when we pivoted the company from, you know, this is not about stat sheet or about, you know, college basketball stats. This is much, much bigger than that. You know, there are these huge, you know, Fortune 50 companies that are willing to pay big money to have their, you know, their BI, their, you know, their business intelligence. You know, it's, we can do this with anything that has structured data. So, you know, we, we raise more money and turned into, you know, more of the NLG for non-basketball verticals. Yeah, that makes sense. And I don't know if this for sure, but I feel like Statsheet was definitely a niche in terms of in terms of the viewership. But why I remember one thing that it had on there was uh like parsed out play by play by um where you could you could look at everyone's a, a given player's shots, like every shot that they had oh, um, yeah. from the play by play parsed out. Like there there was little things like that that made your life a lot easier especially this was years yeah. ago when probably my uh my programming skills weren't as good and and uh and stat sheet was was pretty uh was pretty useful yep hey and the referee stuff like you're saying was like wildly popular yeah like i think i think robbie still gets emails to this day asking like where the referee stuff went or if they can have like copies of the the historical data for that you know probably gamblers and mm-hmm. yeah more of like a betting thing but yeah, Robbie, if you want to have Robbie on the podcast, he'd love to talk about it. For, you'd have to have like a five-hour podcast on the history of stat sheet. <laughs> yeah, he, that's, that's his baby. That might be a solving basketball episode uh, in, in the coming months <laughs> or something. It, it might happen. It might happen. But, Adrian, I really appreciate your time. Um, this, was, this was pretty cool with your background of, of the data and then also all the X's and O's stuff that you've done for UNC and a very relevant topic with, with the charting stuff. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no problem. Love what you're doing, too. The, get, I'm getting my newsletter every Friday, <laughs> digging into that. And all your uh, all your content on Twitter has been excellent. So, yeah, keep it up. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate the newsletter plug. <laughs> Tell the people where to uh, to follow you on on Twitter and and uh, anything else. Your your website, or I believe you have a newsletter too, right? Kind of. Yeah, I mean, Freeport at Freeport Kid is my Twitter, and that's where I'm most active. Uh, Secondary Break, which you plugged to start the show, has not. I haven't been writing writing there on there for a couple of years. But I'm thinking about getting it active again, so we'll see. And the newsletter is the same thing. But I'm also thinking about a Carolina charting project, which is just kind of what I've been doing the last, you know, 15 years or so. But in the off season, extending it to past seasons and just building up a really big database, you know, for all the kind of available games, and you know, everything was televised going as far back as it'll go. You know, getting all the old the Michael Jordans and the Sam Perkinses and the the Jamisons and Carters getting all their charting data, you know, defensive and, you know, shots by by location and shot type and everything. So I think that'd be a, a cool thing to do. And if I launch that, I'll, I'll probably be plugging it all over the place. So Cool. Well, yeah, so Freeport Kid on on Twitter. Yep. It's UNC specific, but it's some of the, I would say, highest quality individual team content that is being done in college basketball. So, so give them a follow. And, yeah, thank you again, Adrian. Yep, thanks. Appreciate it. No hand checking Michael Jordan, Scott Pippen, Tony uh, uh, Kukoc. Uh, uh.